In 1980, the Star Wars magic was back with the release of the second Star Wars movie, The Empire Strikes Back, where Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, and Harrison Ford return as their well-loved Star Wars characters, Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, and Han Solo, as well as new character Lando Calrissian, played by Billy D. Williams. Unlike the first movie, which was a fun space adventure, Empire Strikes Back is more of a bleak and foreboding look into the Star Wars universe. After the Rebels get attacked by the Empire on the planet Hoth, Luke goes to a swamp on the Dagobah system, where he sets out to further his Jedi training with a Jedi Master called Yoda. And meanwhile, the rest of the gang escapes the Empire to Cloud City, where they are greeted by Lando. However, Darth Vader has set up a trap for our heroes, as he plans to turn Luke to the dark side. Luke must now step into a dangerous duel with Vader in order to save his friends, where he learns of devastating revelations. Yeah, The Empire Strikes Back is often considered the best Star Wars movie ever. And for good reason. It's perfectly shot, acted, and like all great sequels, it expands on its universe and ups the stakes. And the behind the scenes of this one has it all. From fires, to blizzards, to directors not wanting to direct, and actors collapsing on sets, and even too much partying with the Rolling Stones. So let's check it out. Number 10, it could have been a completely different low budget movie. So Star Wars came out in 1977 and no one anticipated that it would be a big hit. George Lucas repeatedly kept getting told that no one wants to see spaceship movies and that science fiction was a thing of the past. But lo and behold, Star Wars comes out and really resonates with the public zeitgeist and became the biggest movie of 1977 and a sequel immediately went into production. However, before Star Wars was released, there was already plans for a sequel. If Star Wars failed at the box office, as was anticipated, then the plan was for a sequel to be a smaller, low-budget movie, where Lucas teamed up with science fiction writer Alan Dean Foster to come up with a low-key story. The result was a story of Luke and Leia crash landing on a planet called Mimban, where they have to seek help from the planet locals while avoiding the Empire and Darth Vader. And the story introduces mystical crystals called Kyber Crystals, which are old relics of the Force and can increase the power of a being who is Force sensitive by a thousand times over. However, this idea was dropped after the huge success of Star Wars where Lucas wanted to go bigger with the sequel, with a different and more lucrative and ambitious story. However, this abandoned sequel idea was published as a novel in 1978, called Splinter of the Mind's Eye, and was the first Star Wars novel to be an original story. Number 9. Lucas got full creative control but was fined for it. Lucas made a handsome profit over the merchandise rights alone to over Star Wars. And thus, if he wanted to, he could have walked out of the Star Wars brand. But he didn't want to, as he wanted to keep telling his story and not to leave it in someone else's hands. He also wanted complete creative control without studio interference. So 20th Century Fox made a 100 page contract with Lucas, which proclaimed they would have no creative control over the Star Wars sequel, and in return they would get 50% of the movie's profits of the movie's first $20 million that it would make, and further set profits if the movie succeeds $100 million. Lucas put all the money that he made from the original Star Wars into the sequel, which was $12 million, as well as putting some of that money into his special effects company, Industrial Light and & Magic, and his Skywalker Ranch movie studio. And what was left he used as collateral for a bank loan. So it was a big gamble for Lucas, as he stood to lose everything if Empire Strikes Back was a failure. So either way, Lucas had complete creative control with no studio interference. 
However, George Lucas's creative ideas also got him into some legal hot water, as the Writers and Directors Guild of America objected to Lucas featuring the cast and crew credits at the end of the movie, and not at the start of the movie as most movies did back then. Lucas didn't want the credits at the start of the movie, in favour of the famous Space Crawl, which gets the viewer up to speed with what's going on. So Lucas didn't give in and kept the credits at the end, and because of this, he was fined over $250,000 by the guilds. The funny thing is, it's now commonplace for movies to start without credits and to just feature the credits at the end of the movie. An example of this is the Christopher Nolan Dark Knight trilogy. Number 8. Original Ideas when it came to creating the Star Wars sequel, Lucas had lots of ideas, but no solid structure yet. He knew that he wanted the sequel to be darker, and to have more mature themes with deeper character development, and for the movie to be bigger and more ambitious than the first Star Wars movie. Lucas was starting to put together the production for the sequel, and he originally wasn't going to rehire producer Gary Kurtz, who produced the first movie, due to issues that arose while making that first Star Wars movie, but Kurtz convinced Lucas to rehire him. Lucas teamed up with science fiction writer and script writer Lee Brackett to help write an early draft of the script. Now, there are many similarities between this early draft and the final film, but there are also lots of differences too, including the revelation of Luke's long-lost twin sister called Nellif. Yep, originally Leia wasn't his sister. And in the script, it's also felt that Leia was actually more of a damsel in distress. New character Lando Calrissian was an ex-clone from the Clone Wars, Yoda was a frog-like creature called Minch, Han Solo set out on a mission to find his stepfather, and in this early version, Darth Vader was not Luke's father. In fact, in this version, the Force ghost of Luke's father visits Luke along with the ghost of Obi-Wan Kenobi. And there was even the introduction of a super stormtrooper, who would get rewritten as Boba Fett, who was actually introduced in the animated section of the Star Wars Holiday Special. Also at this time, the movie was called Star Wars Chapter 2, and it was supposedly producer Gary Kurtz who suggested The Empire Strikes Back as a title, as sequels were kind of known as not doing as good as their originals, so by getting rid of the numbering trend and giving the movie its own title was an attempt to get out of the sequel curse. Sadly, shortly after completing the first draft, Brackett passed away. So to do rewrites, Lucas then hired Lawrence Kasdan, as at that time he was also working on the script for fellow Lucasfilm production Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Lucas liked his work. And thus, as the drafts went on, the story would start to resemble more and more the final film, minus a few other ideas thrown around, like Darth Vader having a castle, and a revelation that Vader was actually scared of the Emperor, and an alien species called the Hogmen. Finally, in March 1979, a fifth draft was completed, and The Empire Strikes Back was ready to take form. Number 7. Irving Kirshner Didn't Want to Strike Back Quite early on in the production of The Empire Strikes Back, Lucas knew that he did not want to direct the picture, due to the stress and health issues that he faced while making the first movie, with him instead acting as executive producer. Lucas had thought about several other directors who could take over directing duties, including Saturday Night Fever director John Badham and Pink Floyd's The Wall director Alan Parker. But Lucas sought assistance from his old friend and mentor, Irvin Kirshner, who at that stage had mainly directed low-key movies like A Fine Madness and Eyes of Laura Mars. Where Lucas approached Kirshner and offered him to direct the Star Wars sequel, to which Kirshner's answer was short and sweet. No. Yeah. He had no intentions of directing a sequel, as he felt a Star Wars sequel would not be able to top the original Star Wars. And Kirshner also wasn't a fan of Star Wars. He thought that it was just too much of a comic book, which wasn't to his taste. And he also didn't like the script. And when Lucas told him that he was funding the movie himself, Kirshner then really did not want to direct, fearing that the whole thing would be a disaster. Lucas kept contacting Kirshner, trying to convince him to direct, and Kirshner kept saying no. He was actually afraid of what a colossal failure the whole thing might be. Kirshner said that even his agent kept telling him to direct The Empire Strikes Back, because his agent saw dollar bills, whereas Kirshner saw many sleepless nights. Until Lucas told Kirshner that it's not a sequel, but a chapter in a bigger story, and that Kirshner would have full control of the movie with no interferences, 
it'll simply be his film. And so finally Kirshner gave in, and stepped up to the task of being the Empire Strikes Back's director. And so this reluctant older director, who didn't really like Star Wars and really didn't want to direct it, went out and just so happened to make the best Star Wars movie ever. And despite not wanting to make a comic book style movie, Kirshner would actually go on to direct several comic book styled movies, including the unofficial James Bond movie, Never Say Never Again, and Robocop 2. Well, it doesn't get any more comic book than James Bond and Robocop. Number six, creative twists and turns. So the start of the movie sees Luke Skywalker getting attacked by a big snow monster called a Wampa which leaves him with a bloodied face, where afterwards we see Luke in a medical facility on the rebel base of Hoth, where we see that he has facial scarrings. This subplot of Luke's face getting mauled by a monster was added after Hamill was in a real-life car crash shortly after filming the first Star Wars movie, where his car flipped over and shattered his face. This subplot was written to explain any facial scarring that Hamill had on his face. One memorable moment in Empire is just before Han Solo gets frozen, where Leia tells him that she loves him, to which Han replies, I know. This wasn't in the script, but Harrison Ford ad-libbed the line, feeling that that is what the character of Han Solo would say. And this supposedly caused an argument between Lucas and Ford, as Lucas didn't want the character to reply with, I know, but Ford stuck to his guns. And when the line, I know, was spoken through theatre screenings, it apparently got great cheers from the audience. Look, Han Solo is a cool and slick character. Saying that is just totally something he would do, so I think it works. It shows that even in the face of danger, he still has his smart ass and won't give in to fear. Also, the movie's ending of Han Solo being frozen was deliberately written to be ambiguous as to whether or not Han Solo would survive, on the account that Ford wasn't contracted to star in another Star Wars movie. The Empire Strikes Back includes several new characters, including fan favourite Boba Fett, and this guy whose name I can't remember, but as a kid I always knew him as Robo Ears. Speaking of Boba Fett, originally his costume design was to be all white. And yeah, it's weird seeing Boba Fett in an all white getup. I mean, being a bounty hunter, you would think his attire would not look so clean and would look a little beaten up and like he has seen some battles. So it makes sense for them to go with the look that they went with. And of course, we have fellow fan favorite, Lando Calrissian, played by Billy D. Williams. I love this character, as he's explained as being a bit of a scoundrel like Han Solo, but he also has a sense of elegance about him. He's charming and slick, and has a redemption story arc. Actors who are considered for the part include Howard Rowlands and Yafet Kodo. One of the reasons Williams was fascinated with the character was because he had a cape, and he considered him to be a pretty cool guy. When it came to bringing the Jedi Master Yoda to life, it was decided to use a puppet. And Lucas originally wanted Jim Henson to be Yoda's puppeteer and to provide the character's voice. But he was too busy, so fellow puppeteer Frank Oz came on board to perform Yoda. Oz at that time was probably best known for playing Miss Piggy in The Muppets. Yoda's face was incidentally modelled after Albert Einstein. The Empire Strikes Back is also the first time we see the Emperor. Although in subsequent movies, the part was played by actor Ian McDermott, for this first appearance, the part was played by a painter and photographer called Marjorie Eaton, and was voiced by stage and theatre actor Clive Revel. And oddly, footage of chimpanzees' eyes were inserted over Eaton's real eyes, I guess to make the character look more abnormal. And finally, we have the jaw-dropping scene where Vader tells Luke that he is his father definitely one of the biggest twists in movie history. I mentioned before that in the original script, Luke's father wasn't Vader, but a forced ghost with Obi-Wan. But Lucas has since maintained that it was always intended for Vader to be Luke's father. He just kept it a secret to avoid script leaks. Well, while filming that scene, only Mark Hamill and Irvin Kirshner knew the plot twist, as Star Vader actor David Prowse originally said, Obi-Wan killed your father. Although there are some claims that he also said, Obi-Wan is your father. And it was later, while dubbing the dialogue for that scene, that James L. Jones provided the infamous line, I am your father. And no one knew about this highly kept secret till the movie's premiere. 
Interestingly, in the documentary I Am Your Father, which was a documentary about Darth Vader actor David Prowse, it is revealed that very shortly after the release of the first Star Wars movie, David Prowse did an interview for a newspaper where he said that in a subsequent movie it should be revealed that Vader is Luke's father. Long before anyone could have known about this plot twist. <laughs> and it's interesting seeing the crew members of the original trilogy being presented with this article, where they put it down to being a coincidence, or maybe even Prowse being psychic. Number 5. Hostile Filming Environments the shoot for Empire was very difficult, with the cast and crew suffering illnesses, injuries and conflict. The snowy scenery of the planet Hoff was actually filmed in Finns, Norway, and this was not an easy location to film in. While filming, the production was hit with blizzards, as well as the worst snowstorm the area had seen in half a century. Temperatures could get so cold, the video cameras would freeze along with the film inside. And according to Wikipedia, some crew members even suffered with minor frostbite. Due to the snowy elements of the location, most of the crew could barely see anything while filming, so it was a tough shoot. One member of the crew even slipped over and broke some of his ribs. There was also other issues like avalanches blocking links of transport and trenches that had been dug out having to be dug up again after getting filled in by snow. Not to mention there were constant delays to filming, including a four week pause on filming to build heated shelter for helicopters that were being used to film certain location scenes. On some occasions, some scenes were even shot just outside the cast and crew's hotel. The intended shot of the probe landing on the planet at the start of the movie wasn't captured, as a battery was accidentally knocked out of a radio, which gave the announcement to start filming. But thankfully, footage of the explosion was taken by a helicopter which was also filming the scene. Despite how tough it was to film at the location, the crew soldiered on and pulled through. But I bet everyone was probably happy to leave the location behind. So it'll seem that now the productions can head back to the studios in England that all their troubles are behind them, right? Well, wrong. The troubles concerning this production had only just started. Number four, The Shining affected the studio's filming. As with the other two Star Wars movies in the original trilogy, on-set filming for The Empire Strikes Back took place at Elstree Studios, England. But at the time of filming, Stanley Kubrick was filming the horror masterpiece The Shining also at Elstree Studios. Sadly, the main soundstage for The Shining had caught fire and had burnt to rubble. Because of this, The Shining's production had to use stages that were planned to be used for The Empire Strikes Back, which caused even more delays in filming. These delays even being more drastic. Yeah, how unfortunate. One minute Empire's production was battling ice, now it's battling fire. The movie's main stars, including Mark Hamill, Harrison Ford, and Carrie Fisher, would all suffer significant injuries and illnesses while filming. Fisher in particular got a really nasty case of the flu, as well as bronchitis, which made her drastically lose weight, and she even collapsed on set while filming due to an allergic reaction to paint materials that were used on the set. Also at the time of filming, Hamill was suffering from isolation-induced depression. While filming the Dagobah scenes, on the account that he spent so many times filming those scenes and there was literally no one else on the set but robots and puppets. Not to mention the fact that the shoot was really long. And in addition to that, the set was sprayed with a mineral oil, which also affected his physical health as well as his mental health. To cheer Hamill up, one day Miss Piggy visited the set, who of course was performed by Hamill's Yoda co-star Frank Oz. Which thankfully did ease the tension and lighten the mood and seemed to put a smile on Hamill's face. Hamill had to subsequently take time off due to a hand injury, but he became really annoyed when he was required to come back and film a stunt scene on the day that his son was born. And this made him frustrated with producer Gary Kurtz for not using a stunt double. And then director Irvin Kirshner was frustrated with Hamill for supposedly not following his direction. And so Hamill was frustrated with Kirshner's directing style. Yeah, look, it seems that everyone was annoyed and frustrated. And you know what? Maybe this tension helped with the darker and more foreboding vibe of The Empire Strikes Back. 
There is also a photo shoot involving the main cast where it looks like they just really let loose and went a little crazy, getting up to all kinds of misbehaving, as if they're like naughty school kids or something. This is probably because the cast were quite literally going mad and just needed to let it all out and unleash all that crazy that was inside them. But hey, that's just a theory of mine. Incidentally, some of the injuries on set were self-inflicted, as Ford and Fisher were really hungover while filming the scene where they landed at Cloud City, as the previous night they were out partying with Eric Idle and the Rolling Stones, <laughs> as you do. Now, would you believe me if I was to say that that wasn't the end of the problems haunting this production, and that the worst was yet to come? Number 3, The Empire Strikes Back had gone over schedule and budget. The Bank of America, who Lucas had invested with to finance the movie, were not happy with the rising costs of making The Empire Strikes Back, of which was mainly due to all the delays in filming. They were informed that the budget was $17 million, but Lucas and Kurtz knew that it would actually be closer to $30 million to complete the film. To make matters worse, with 20% of the movie left to shoot, the production had run out of money, and the bank refused to put any more money into it, and 20th Century Fox was planning on buying out their arrangement with Lucas and to take over filming, meaning Lucas would lose his creative control. Thankfully, Lucas Films would do a deal with the Bank of Boston, who refinanced the loan to $27 million, and 20th Century Fox forked out another $3 million, and in return, they had increase in their percentages of merchandise profits. So thankfully, the production could get back on track with the required budget, with Lucasfilm at stake if the movie fails. As Empire Strikes Back had now become one of the most expensive movies of its time. So the production now had a $30 million budget, which looms over the first movie's mere $11 million budget. I think it's obvious that Empire did have more money spent on it, as it works, as the movie looks grander and more expanded, and the effects are more polished. Although some cuts may have been taken, hence the poor extra known as Ice Cream Man, where one extra can be seen frantically running around with an ice cream maker, with the Star Wars community famously naming him Ice Cream Man. Who knows, maybe this character just really likes ice cream and had to save that maker. But it's not all bad, as Ice Cream Man, or the character's actual name, Will Rowe Hood, has actually developed quite the fan following in modern years. However, the dilemmas behind the scenes may have taken their toll, as producer Gary Kurtz would never work with Lucas again after Empire, as he didn't like the more commercial direction that Star Wars was going in, and felt that it was now more about selling toys. He could understand the need to sell toys in order to make profit, but he also felt that it's not the best direction to take to make quality films. Number 2. Deleted Scenes Just as with the other Star Wars movies, there are tons of deleted scenes which didn't make it into the final film. These include an extended scene of Han and Leia bickering at the start of the movie when Han makes plans to leave the Rebellion. There is also a subplot where a couple of Wumpa monsters break into the Rebel base. We see one of them get killed by Rebel soldiers, and the other is still let loose and attacks a snowtrooper. I'm guessing this subplot was added to add more action and suspense, but it doesn't add to the actual story, which if left in, could have really slowed everything down. There are black and white clips of Luke in the medical bay, where the rest of the gang look on nervously. And is it just me or does Chewie look terrifying in black and white? He looks like the Wolfman or something. There's a subsequent scene of Leia visiting Luke while he's healing, with their chemistry giving off more of a romantic connection. I guess the original plan was to have a love triangle going on between Luke, Leia, and Han, but given that it would be discovered that Leia is Luke's sister, just makes this romantic connection wrong and awkward. Yeah, she does kiss him in the final film, which is still icky, but I always felt that she did that to get back at Han. You know, to shut him up and to put his ego back a notch. Speaking of that medical facility, there are some still images of a deleted scene showing Luke's scars bandaged up. And I don't know, to me it looks really creepy. I'm seriously getting Vanilla Sky vibes here. Thankfully, this scene wasn't left in, and thus didn't leave us all terrified. There are also additional scenes of Luke training with Yoda at the Dagobah system, which I will admit is fascinating seeing that these scenes are important to Luke's journey, as well as more scenes in the asteroid, and Robo-Ears getting captured by stormtroopers. 
There's another scene at the end of Leia attending to Luke's hand after having it cut off during his duel with Darth Vader, where once again I can't help but feel like they were trying to give off romantic vibes between the two characters. This just would not have felt right, especially after Leia declaring her love for Han. So as for these deleted scenes, do I think it was right to cut them out? Absolutely I do. Empire is perfect the way that it is, and these scenes just would have slowed everything down, as well as adding more of an uncomfortable romance between Luke and Leia. The only scenes that I think are worth their weight in gold to me is the scenes of Luke training, but I don't think it's vital. So yeah, I could personally do without these scenes. And there's the 1997 Special Edition, and I think that most fans feel that Empire was spared the least when it came to the changes, with them not being particularly as blatant. And that is because Empire was already perfect. Some even feel that the later changes do actually enhance the movie, with the movie now featuring Ian McDermott as the Emperor, replacing the previous scenes from the original cut. Number 1. The Box Office Strikes Back there wasn't much faith in The Empire Strikes Back to be a smash hit, as it was a sequel, and sequels were notorious for not doing as good as their originals. And at that particular time, it was comedies that were making all the money in the box office. Due to movie audiences wanting to lighten up due to the hassles of a real-life recession at that time, with movies like Stir Crazy and Airplane being big hits. And, well, let's face it, Empire Strikes Back isn't exactly a laugh-out-loud movie. And it was also felt that the latest science fiction craze that Star Wars started may have fizzled out, thanks to Star Trek The Motion Picture not getting very good reviews, and Disney's The Black Hole being a financial flop, of which both movies came out one year before The Empire Strikes Back. 20th Century Fox didn't spend much money in advertising or promoting the film, and upon its release they actually gave it a limited release, which was a strategic move in order to get the movie popular through word of mouth. Well, as it happened, The Empire Strikes Back was a massive success, and Star Wars was once again the current pop cultural phenomenon. It didn't make as much as the first Star Wars movies, $775 million, but still made a very impressive income, bringing in round about $540 million, making it the highest earning movie of 1980. If you can believe it, The Empire Strikes Back actually got fairly mixed reviews from critics upon its release, with it being felt that it just wasn't as fun or as joyful as the first movie, with some critics not enjoying its darker, downbeat tone. The Wall Street Journal thought that this dramatic approach stripped Star Wars of its innocence, and of course there were some who were left unsatisfied with the cliffhanger ending. But there was also some who actually really liked this darker, more adult approach, and actually found it to be better than the first Star Wars movie. But as time has gone on is where Empire has really shined, and not only is it largely considered the best Star Wars movie, but many consider it to be one of the greatest movies of all time in general. Empire seems to be the go-to movie when fans express their love of the franchise. It seems to mark Star Wars at its peak, when it was at its best, at the top of its game. I think what really works for Empire is the fact that it does mature the mythology. Unlike the first movie, which was a fun space fantasy, Empire subverts expectations with shocks and revelations that catches the viewers off guard and keeps them on their toes. It takes a more foreboding, melancholy approach. The whole movie is dripping with a sense of panic and foreboding, with urgency. It's now as much of an emotional journey than it is an action-packed one. Basically, this time, the characters that we have grown to love get dragged to hell, where we see them at their most defeated, which ups the stakes and makes us care about them more. The original Star Wars may have made us fall in love with the mythology, but Empire Strikes Back expanded on that love by going through more emotional maturity and upping the stakes rather than just space battles all over again and thus acting as the perfect second chapter in a three-part story. Thanks to Empire Strikes Back, the Star Wars brand was no longer a special effects show for us to point at and go, Oh wow, look at that! And look at all those space battles! But now it was a space drama, and it made us care as much about the characters than it did the special effects, as we get to follow these characters on their personal journeys. It's almost like there was a drastic evolution between the first and second movies. 
And I think the drama and suspense, as well as the expected special effects panache, makes Empire Strikes Back a perfect Star Wars movie. Anyway, I'm Minty, and I am actually not your father. Yeah, what a twist. See ya!